So I'm going to be talking about an evolutionary approach to implementing Kanban at Drilling Info uh, for the next about hour or so. So let me introduce myself. My name's Jay Paulson. Uh, I have about 15 years of software engineering experience. Well, actually about 16 now. I've been implementing Kanban for about five years or so at companies like eBay, at startups, at Drilling Info. Tried doing a little bit at IBM. Uh, and I trained as a, a Kanban coach from the Lean Kanban University taught by David back in September of 2014. You can't really see it, but this is that's the Golden Gate Bridge in the background there. Uh, it's kind of washed out, which is unfortunate. I started at Drilling Info back in November of 2014. And if you would like to follow me on Twitter, there's my Twitter handle. Uh, there's my LinkedIn as well. And of course, I'm speaking here today, which is pretty cool. So a little bit about drilling info. It's in the oil and gas industry. And as you all know, oil prices have pretty much tanked. So a lot has changed in the past 18 months or so. It was founded in 1999. And it's a $100 million privately held company. They have about 500 employees. That number has actually shrinked now because of the uh, market constraints. We have about 40 software engineers, which uh, which is interesting because a company like some place like Bizarre Voice, about a third of their whole company is engineers. Well, we, we don't have anywhere near that. <laughs> we're, we're hardly hitting 10%, but we're all over the place. Our headquarters are in Austin, Austin, Texas. We have a team in Denver. Uh, we still have a team half-time in Costa Rica. Uh, we have one team left in Ukraine. Uh, we got rid of all of our Indian people unfortunately, and our California team is no longer there either. And this is just recent too, so we're going through a lot of change, which I'll kind of get to in a little bit. Uh, and we use a couple of tools to track our work. We use Rally, uh, Jira, and some teams, they, they started off with physical boards, but now they've moved into the electronic arena. So appropriateness. When is it not appropriate to do Kanban? So, for my journey to get to Jilling Info, I went through a startup that was a pretty uh, horrible experience, some people would say. Uh, and it was definitely a lower maturity organization. They, they were very impatient. You had to get everything done now, 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 now. Uh, they panicked under stress. If we don't get this done now, we're going to go out of business. They had very low trust. When I started there, everybody had their own office, basically. And they were highly siloed. They didn't show any of their work because there was a big blame society. The, the CSO would go around looking for problems and actually uh, concoct some things. It was really incredible. Uh, they had poor risk management. They actually had no risk management, none whatsoever. A lack of alignment between vision and strategy and action and lack of alignment between strategy and capability. Um, so they had a vision of what they wanted to do and they had a strategy, but they had no action really put in place to actually execute on it very well because they didn't have the capability to actually do it. Uh, we ran a forecasting exercise and found out they wanted about six months of work from the engineering team done in about a month, which was just, it's just kind of crazy. And they were revolutionary, not evolutionary. What does that mean? Uh, evolutionary humbled, revolutionary. They were arrogant, grand gestures, great victory, the hero culture. So at this company, they were very, um, they, they gave something called a rock star award for people who worked a whole bunch to get something out the door. We had people missing vacations or canceling them entirely. One person missed the birth of their child because of that. They got an award. It was crazy. So this was what I was not looking for when I was going to drilling, inform drilling info. Uh, I was looking for the exact opposite of this. And I think I found it in, in drilling info, which was uh, a nice change. So where did I start? So whenever I originally had my interview, my hiring manager, he actually understood some of what Kanban was because he was actually measuring lead times, which was a big benefit to me because the rest of the organization was doing Scrum and points and they were pretty like, firm in their commitment to Scrum. Uh, but whenever I got hired, I trained the team with the Git Kanban game. Who here has played the Git Kanban game? Several people. If you haven't played it, highly recommend you go outside and you talk to the inventor of the game, he's here. He has a board. I have an older version of it, but it's still highly effective. I actually created a 
slide deck that kind of parallels the game to introduce core concepts and whatnot as you play the game. And then I created a follow-up kind of training or workshop that implemented this, the static method uh, for creating the boards for these teams. And whenever I uh, did our data warehousing team and converted them from Scrum to Kanban, uh, it took them about six hours to get their board up and running. And other teams, it took less than an hour. It was pretty amazing how uh, bought into teams were uh, whenever they were creating their own process. Then we create, then I created the physical board, uh, and which we'll get to see in a minute, and continued using DI's electronic tool rally. So I didn't change anything. That was probably my top priority was to come in and not change anything. Uh, interesting story about that is the kind of go-to scrum master guy that was there. Second week I started, he said, hey Jay, you know, come here, I want to talk to you. So he pulled me into his office, sat me down, and he said, Consider this a warning shot. Don't change anything. And I was like, oh, dude, oh, wait a second. <laughs> I was like, I'm not changing anything. All I'm doing is putting stickies on a board and tracking when we start stuff and when we stop stuff. You just tell me what you need, and I will get it to you. You know? That guy eventually left. Not surprising. Uh, but uh, we continued to use their tools. We started tracking three additional metrics, which was lead time, delivery rate, and work in process. So. Once we got the board up, can't really see it, which is unfortunate. But this is actual the columns that we had. So we started with, we won't, well, we wanted to see the whole value stream, right? We wanted to see the moment it came in all the way to whenever it was delivered to the customer. And so we started with ideas. Uh, in, our, in our release planning meetings, which was once a quarter, I would get up in front of everybody in the, in the company, basically, and say, you need to tell us who you are when you make a request, a high level of what it is, and when you need it by. And you either email it to us, you can come to our stand-ups, you can put a sticky on our board, but we need that information in order to move forward with what it is you, you want so we can schedule it appropriately. Uh, one guy didn't follow that recommendation. He put something on our board. It's very cryptic. Didn't have a need by date. We didn't know who to ask, so we threw it away. Three days before he needed it, he came back and he said, why isn't my thing done? I'm like, what are you talking about? He said, you know, that thing I put up there. He's like, oh, that thing? Oh, well, we didn't know who to ask. We didn't know who it was, so we threw it away. And he said, you know, we can expedite something through our system and help you out, or we can, you know, handhold you all the way through and, and, and get it done. Uh, and he just stormed off pretty angry and went and implemented it himself. I always try to teach, you know, there has to be consequences, but they have to be safe to fail consequences. And this, in my opinion, was a safe to fail thing that changed his behavior ultimately. And he started actually following our policies if he wanted something to get done. But anyway, you'll see this other column. It's called Robert. There used to be assessment. Robert is my boss. He was up at the board during one of our grooming sessions looking at all of our options. He's like, I don't know what this is. I don't know what that is. What are you doing? I said, well, why don't we put a column up and put a policy that has your name on it. And one of the policies is you have to review the card or write the requirements and sign off on it. And then you know exactly what the team is doing. And he liked that idea. And so we changed it to Robert. So we evolved right then and there. And, and ever since, he's been understanding what the team has been doing and moving work through the system. Then we have acceptance where we uh, add more accepting criteria. We use behavior-driven development, so given when then. Uh, and actually, the, uh, the de developers write that given when then. Uh, we don't have someone writing requirements for us. And then we go to grooming where the team reviews it with the product owner, kind of that final place where we can actually ask questions to make sure what we're going to commit to is, is what they want. And so I have three things here. So I talked about the commit point. Um, and from what I've learned, that commit point is the Spice Girls question. Tell me what you want, what you really, really want. Because as soon as we pull it in and we start that work, we're, we're committed to, to deliver it. We're, and we don't want to discard it because it'll be super expensive. Because engineers are just expensive. Um, and so we have this system lead time here. And this is what we would use to kind of give set expectations to our customers of how long something's going to take. And then we have this 
customer lead time, so from the customer's perspective, once they request something, how long does it take to get, get in their hands? And then we had of our options development, and this is all the options we had to choose from before we commit. So this is kind of how we set up the board uh, when, we, when we first started. So what did that board look like? So I went out and I purchased two 4x6 whiteboards. And I put one right next to the other, and this is the one on the left. This is our options development board. And we have a whole bunch of stickies and a whole bunch of colors and a whole bunch of stuff. And all that stuff meant something, right? So you'll see we have our whip limits across the top. And we actually have some min and max whip limits here to try to create a funnel effect for these options. Uh, we had a delivery rate of three, so we always tried to have three things in here in our grooming section so we could actually pull stuff in and, and work on it. Uh, and then our acceptance, we had uh, a max of 12 and a min of six, and then Robert was a max of 24 and a min of 12. And we had a, an infinite queue over there and ideas that people would just request work. And then we have our physical board on the right-hand side, which is the committed work. So over here, you'll see our commit point right here, and you'll see our key, our legend, for what all the cards mean, and then you'll see our agenda for our stand-ups on the right-hand side. So we'd hit all these things, and we would take stuff away and add stuff as it deemed necessary. And then we had our kind of in-progress was implementation and demo, and this was a small team. There's was only two guys. And so we had a whip limit of three. Uh, but we were also serving, seeing a lot of demand on ourselves because we were building a Docker infrastructure and microservices and, and whatnot just for our own team. So we put that down here called platform. And it's basically our class of service called platform. Then we had the service demand coming from other teams. And so we had a, a higher class of service called service, imagine that. Uh, and that would kind of trump anything else that was going on. So if we had a request from another team to create a microservice for them to get the data they needed for their web app, it would go there and we would pull it through faster and pay more attention to it. And then down here we had a kind of a wait queue or work that was not on our team, but we wanted to track it. And so anything that would get blocked here because of dependency or whatnot, we would pull it down into a wait queue. And then whenever it got unblocked, we'd bring it back in the flow. But we, all, we always had that there because we wanted to make sure that we were tracking uh, things that we cared about, other dependencies that we cared about. So we wanted to see that. And then we have this release, which is uh, a handoff to another team. So it was an infinite queue. And then we had verify and production. And all these little guys here, these are all the policies of the checklist that had to get done in order to move cards to the next, next state of work. And so we use Rally. So again, you can't really see this, but you know, what I would do after every stand-up is spend about five minutes and update this board. And then also uh, put, a, put my metrics in. So metrics, everybody likes to talk about metrics. So what did we do to, to get the metrics? So we captured them two ways. So I manually would just put them in a Google spreadsheet. Some people, they would just use Rally and then they would export that as a CSV file and put it in a tool that I wrote called Lean Sheets, which we're currently rewriting. So if you guys like to be a part of a beta and give me some feedback, that would be fantastic. You can tweet me. There's my Twitter handle down there. But as three basic charts, histogram, lead time run chart, and Cooper flow diagram. One of the things that I noticed a while ago was that a lot of these tools that are out there, Rally for instance, doesn't give you this, these charts or these reports that I would find valuable in order to be able to manage my team and set expectations for the business and whatnot. So I just, I just wrote my own. So what did this look like? So we had a Kuma flow diagram that I created. And so this is work in process in a particular state. And these are dates down here that you can't really see. But this is all the done work. And then this is all the work in progress on that date. And up there, so you could, you could choose your dates. You had a drop down there to show all the work or you could filter it by work types or class of service or whatever it is you wanted. Click query, boom, you have your graph. Uh, this is a very rudimentary one. Uh, I read Dan Vacanti's book, which I'll show you at the end. He goes over these charts in great detail. I think Frank Vega is mentioned in there several times. He's sitting over there, that's why I say that. 
Uh, and then we have our lead time run chart. And so if you guys went to Alexi's talk this morning, he talked about standard deviation and how that doesn't tell you anything. Well, this actually has the standard deviation in it. So I wrote this tool back late 2013, 2014 before I learned about standard deviation not really giving you a lot of value. But what was very interesting about this chart is, is this is the average, the red line is the average. So for this data set, which is, I can't really read that. I think it's, it's like last quarter, 2015 maybe. But you had a eight business days on average to get something done and you had standard deviation of, I think this is 16 and one, or 15 and one, 13 and one. Um, but we have these outliers, and you'll see in the, in the histogram chart, you'll see that tail, uh, the Weibull tail. And so each dot is one work item. And what was interesting is that whenever the CTO caught wind that, we, that I was doing this and another team was doing this, he really likes this chart. He especially likes the things that are above this green line. And the reason why he likes those things above the green line is because he wants to see if he can help make those not be outliers, right? And so what he's asked the teams to do is for everything above that green line, he wants delay reasons. Because he'll take this chart you know, to his uh, once a month executive team leadership meeting and his executive team and the board will say, what in the world is going on over here? Why did that take 36 business days to get done, right? And so he'll have a, have a way to be able to talk to that. But the behavior to get better is that now it's a challenge for the managers of each team using Kanban to not have outliers because they hate writing the delay reasons. They can't stand it. They think it's a waste of time. Uh, so they're, they're trying to game the system in order not to do that. So we're getting some improvements. So they'll delay things that they know that they have dependencies and not start them and choose something else before then. And if they choose something and they start it and they run into a dependency, it sparks a conversation of why didn't they identify that dependency and they try to make improvements so they don't have it. So it's actually a really good thing to have that kind of top line there even though it's uh, maybe not providing a lot of value from the data perspective. But here's our histogram. You know, as you can see, the outlier is way over here. It's the 36 day, 25 days. Uh, but what this is actually doing is, I have this line overlay over the chart. And so if you mouse over that point right there, it's saying this, this point here represents 84% of the work to the left. So now we can start saying with 14 business days, you have about 85% confidence. So roughly for this data set, you're looking at about three weeks uh, to get something with high confidence. So this was, this chart had a, a lot of explaining to do because I would introduce it as the money chart. Because this is what you, where you get your confidence that you're actually going to deliver. This is super important. And so if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask while I talk. And so we kind of went into Little's Law. So I had to explain what Little's Law was to pretty much everybody in the organization. And so in my training, I had this slide as well. Uh, I did a lot of lunch and learns. I would introduce this. But Little's Law basically says your average delivery rate equals your average whip divided by lead time, your average lead time. And in uh, manufacturing, that's usually the arrival rate. But in software, it was changed to delivery rate. Uh, we use this to do our capacity forecasting. Um, and I think Dan Vicanti says is if you use this for uh, capacity forecasting or anything else, you, you should get slapped. So I tweeted him back. I said, I hope I don't get slapped because I've been using it. <laughs> uh, but we don't have any other tools. And so we don't have any Monte Carlo simulations. We don't have any of that stuff. I mean, we're a big data company. And we don't have these tools. It's, it just blows me away, right? So we, we use this. And we plug, each team plugs in, plugs in their uh, stuff. Uh, plugs in their, plugs in their uh, data and figures out what that delivery rate is. And we actually use this uh, to, to give to the CTO. And what he does with it is this. And so he would be going to these ELT meetings and the sales team would come up with these forecasting charts with their 90th percent confidence that they'll make it and it was called their commit. And they would have an 85% confident, and that was called their stretch plan. And they would have a 
think, 80% confident. That was called their, their best case. And the CTO said, I want, I want this. Someone give me this. And I was like, aha, I can give you that. We have that data. And so since each team was using my tool and we had the histogram, right, we had this guy, we could actually come in and say, you know, go to the 90th percentile, even with the outliers in there, we go to the 90th percentile and use that number and plug that in in the lead time. And then since we had this guy, we knew how much we would deliver in a month. So we would be able to plug those things in and figure out our average whip and whatnot, and then we could plug them in here. Here's what we could do 90% confidence for our team most icily. And then 65%, because he didn't want 85th or 80th, he wanted these numbers. So we'd do 65% confidence, 43 cards, and 50% 50, 50 confidence, one in two chance that we'll do 61 cards. And so this, then we have the actual, so this is for last December. You can't see that, it's up there. It's all whited out. This is for last December. These were the actuals here. And so whenever I've given this presentation, people are like, why do you have, why did, what happened there? Why did you get 66? You did better than your forecast. I said, that's a great question, because now at least we can start asking the reasons why. Maybe in November, half the team went on vacation for a couple weeks. Who knows? Maybe they got blocked a whole bunch. But at least now we can start asking those questions and start saying, you know, we want to get 66 cards every single time. Let's figure out what we did last time to make that happen so we can repeat that pattern and we can keep track of it, right? And as you can see, we went down, this team kind of hit between you know, the 65th and 70th percentile. This team was 46, so it's kind of here. Uh, this team did 10, which was way over here. This is Sentinels. This was our India team. And what's interesting is that our India team, this data really drove the reason why they're no longer a part of our organization. Because we were able to use the control chart and use these things in order to see how they were actually performing. And they were actually starting stuff and not finishing stuff. And so it was causing a lot of havoc and whatnot. And now our CTO actually had the data to be able to go back to them and say, you need to change or we're going we're gonna to have to let you go. And they didn't change, so we ultimately had to let them go. The DB Tech team, this is our data warehousing team down here. Uh, they did 23 cards in, in December. They were the first team after my, my team that we did a transformation from Scrum to Kanban. And that's an interesting story because they, uh, in Q2 of last year, they said they would commit to 130 cards. They delivered 40. The morale on the team was super low. They were working a ton of hours, and management was pointing fingers at them, and product was pointing fingers at them. Well, you said you could do this. How come you didn't deliver it? So I come in, and I run Little's Law. I analyze the data, and I come back at the release planning meeting, and I have a 90% confidence level that they can do about 30 cards. And I have a 60% confidence level that they can do 60 cards. I bring the product owner over there. I show her the math. I tell her, and she freaks out. She's like, oh my gosh, I need to get more done. This is not good. And I was like, well, you know, you have some options. I like, what, what are they? I need to know. So, like, well, you can hire someone, but it's going to take you about three months to find that person. It's going to take another three to six months for them to be productive. So you're really not going to see that increase in productivity or throughput for quite a while. The other thing we can do is... We can identify what your bottlenecks are, and we identified one of them because he was a single point of failure. And uh, he was totally packed with, with work. And so she went around to all the other different managers and said, hey, can you help with this one technology? She found two people and two managers willing to work with her. And they actually took a lot of that work away from this person and got the knowledge and mitigated that risk of the single point of failure. And she also got funding for three additional headcounts. So this data had a direct impact on that team, which was huge for that team. So we're starting to get better. So I started introducing scheduling and sequencing of work with uh, risk profiles. Still hasn't been picked up, the risk profiling piece. Uh, managing risk by cost of delay. So now people were actually talking about cost of delay and when people needed things in their daily stand-ups and planning sessions and groomings and all sorts of things. We were obviously doing our capacity forecasting. Now every team was doing capacity forecasting. And we had classes of service and we were introducing fit-for-purpose metrics, which I'm still trying to do, and we were doing capacity allocation. 
So this, the capacity allocation is interesting because some of the feedback we got after the first quarter of implementation of their first Kanban board was that they were, they were saying, hey, there's nothing on the product owner priority list. Where is it? I want to know where it is. And so we introduced a new class of service for that so we could identify, you know, we're, we're actually working on business value. And we had another class of service called standard that would handle the demand coming in from other teams. And then we had operations and reports. But the first quarter we ran the, uh, the board, we didn't change anything. We just ran all the work. And then when we reported this, the, the metrics, it was kind of jaw dropping for everybody because we, they saw that about 70% of the work coming through was maintenance and, and, and reporting. And the CTO didn't like that. So he gave, he kind of gave a goal for the team to only do 20% maintenance and reports. And so they really had to struggle with what maintenance item are they going to do in order to meet that goal. Uh, because they, they knew that they needed to focus more on the business value side of things, which was really important. So we're getting better. Uh, and so how do we actually get better as an organization from that system, right? And so you probably saw David's slide. This is from his, his website, the whole seven cadences of Kanban. And so we're getting, we're getting through these guys. So we, we started doing the daily stand-ups for every team. So the team creates agendas. They place for feedback and customer focus. Uh, we do this daily. One team, so we've gone through a big reorg. A new president and CEO has been hired. Uh, he likes all these metrics. He comes to our operations review. Uh, but as a result, there's been a new kind of web team formed. And this team only does uh, stand-ups twice a week, which really isn't enough. And they're also working 10 to 15 hour days, which is not sustainable. And so whenever we actually ran their numbers last week, we realized that over 50% of their time is rework because they're creating a lot of defects because there's an upstream problem of uh, requirements that are not well defined before they started. And there, there's a team of six. There's four engineers and two QA people. And they're, on average, their, their average work and process limit is 10. And so as you can see, they're, they're switching back and forth between things because things change so rapidly on that team. But I've been recommending that they go to daily stand-ups and try to work on that upstream process so they can cut half their time. I think if they could cut half their time from defects, they could actually go at a sustainable pace and actually get more done. But we had this replenishment commitment meeting. Uh, this is weekly. For my team, when we started, we called this grooming, or they called it grooming, so that's the vocabulary we use. Um, we, we, we decided to do two hours a week, two different meetings on Tuesday and Thursday. And uh, it became more of a discard meeting, which was fabulous. What are we not going to do? So we would go to that left of that board where our options development was, and we'd go through all the stuff, and our boss would just pull things down. We're not going to do this, we're not going to do this, we're not going to do this. On the data warehousing team, they had about four months of backlog to get through. And it took us about five weeks to get the product owner in, in order to just sit her down and say, we have all this work from Q1 and Q2 left. Are we, do you still want to do it? And she said, no. And she started pulling things down. We went through them literally one by one. And we got down to about six weeks worth of backlog, which was, which was good, because that team was totally overwhelmed as a result. Um, but some teams, they did it on, on demand. Whenever they needed something to commit to, they would just, boom, go and do a grooming session. Um, and it evolved based on team and customer feedback. And so our delivery planning meeting. So this is actually, for us, it's once a week. We have a kind of a cadence where you have to get on a train and you got to go. We're trying to get to a continuous delivery, uh, but that's... It's been really difficult with our infrastructure and just how they set things up originally. So there has to be some re-architecture done there. And then risk review. Uh, so we, we do blocker clustering. So Klaus has talked about this. He wrote a book on it. Um, and we have, I think, five different categories that we track blockers on. And with Rally, it's, you, you can't really do it. I, don't, I haven't really found a tool that you do blocker clustering effectively with. Uh, so we do it manually, and we put up blockers in our Google spreadsheet, and then we run reports on that and build nice pie charts and whatnot, and we review that as a project management team. Uh, some teams have been reluctant picking this up. They just don't see the value in it. They don't, they don't understand why they would need to do it. Now, the data warehousing team, we ran this, and we reviewed those hidden risks. 
So they, they were actually supporting some really old legacy stuff that was written 15 years ago when the company was founded. And they were maintaining and supporting it. But it had huge risk associated with it. So, we, so I ran an exercise to actually create their risk profiles. So you, we got their dimensions of risk. Is it old code? Is it new code? Who knows it? Who doesn't? If it fails, will the customer cancel their subscription? You know, wh what are all those risk things? And we brought that to the operations review. Well, the first thing was, what is this? How do you read it? So we had to explain to it. And then it drove a ton of discussion, what are we going to do about it? Uh, so it was, it's actually a really, really, really good thing, in my opinion, for uh, bringing to operations review and driving discussion and bringing to the forefront things that may be hidden or buried somewhere else. And so we actually had mitigation strategies. What are we going to do about it? So we would talk about it in this meeting. And then we review the current system to make sure it was still meeting expectations. And we would try to do this monthly. But like I said, this has been hard to keep a regular cadence because people are busy and they don't see the value in it, which is unfortunate. So I've been trying to figure out ways in order to combine it with other meetings they're already at in order to get these answers. And one of the, one of the meetings that I found is the, the replenishment meeting or the grooming session that they have now. Um, we ran this exercise. and. So the project manager at least knows what questions she needs to ask in order to mitigate the risk and help sequence the work more effectively for her. Because she's having to do a lot of the, I think we need to do this next because the product owner is not available to tell them what to do next, which is another problem in of itself. And then there's the strategy review. We are doing this at a quarterly level. It's been changed like since last week. It changed to monthly. but. The way this used to work was it was a uh, release planning session where everybody got together and product came out of their silo and they said, hey, here's the big batch of stuff that we want. So we would see this huge demand wave come in uh, for some of the teams that needed to get things done. In fact, we had this, we had this board with here's all the stuff we, when we need it by and it was the whole quarter going to, the, going to the right. And for several teams, there was this huge pile of stickies over here on the left and some of them were even further to the left. So we would have this planning release session uh, about three weeks before the quarter would start. And some of the things that my team needed to do needed to get done two weeks before the quarter started. And so it just, it, it's not really sustainable. But for some reason, I, you know, I haven't been able to get into the product side of things in order to teach them this stuff and even talk about it enough. Um, so they decided, hey, you know, this is a problem. So we'll just make it smaller in a shorter amount of time. So now we're going to have to do this more often, but still go through the same process of, hey, you have about four hours to decide what you can commit to in, in, a, in a month. And so what I'm saying is maybe we should do some forecasting stuff for that so we can kind of understand if we commit to these things, what is the probability that we can actually make it, right? And kind of just go through that manual process. Uh, I've run it for one of our, uh, one of our projects. That is moving off an Oracle system. And we kind of figured out our estimate is about 60 items for this, for this one project in the best case. In the worst case, maybe about 90. So if we plugged in our, our lead time average and we had everybody working on it, full time on it, it would take us about till the end of Q3 to actually get done. And in the worst case, it would take us to the end of Q4. But what that did is it started a conversation with the CTO who came in and he was like, what, how can we sequence this work in order to hand off some of this work to other teams? What can we do to get off of Oracle as quickly as possible? And then we have our service delivery review, which I try to encompass in maybe a daily stand-up to kind of say, hey, is this still, still hidden the points that we need to, to hit for our customers? Or in you know, planning sessions or any, anywhere else to try to get this uh, again, it's, it's, hard, it's hard for these teams to, to find the time or feel like they have the time to do this because they're so, they feel so overwhelmed with work. One of the hardest things I've found is just the behavioral aspect of things and trying to change behavior and coach them to a new behavior. And I'm trying to use the data in order to show them, hey, you know, if you continue to work 12 hours a day, you're going you're gonna to impact the, the uh, metrics in a certain way and that's going to not benefit you. <laughs> We want to benefit you and help you get a sustainable pace. So let's, let's try to move to a sustainable pace so we can reflect real metrics uh, and expectations of the team. 
And then I introduced the, the operations review on my team first, and as I converted teams over to Kanban and we got data, we would move them into this operations review. So two hour meeting with managers and the CTO comes and the president and the COO comes as well. But it's team focused around the, the work that was done. So we looked at the work done the last month and then we look at the future work and we talk about our strategy and how does that align to company strategy. And then we go over metrics, we go over histogram or run charts, we do a system balance so we keep track of the arrival rate of work, the discard rate of work, and the, and the throughput of the work. And we look at our blocker clustering. Because if there's, if there's a, a cluster of work that gets blocked for a significant amount of time, that raises a flag and the CTO starts asking questions, and so does the president and CEO. They start asking questions about why, why is this happening? What can we do about it? Um, and so here's what the CTO sent out an email about the operations review back in December. He finds it very, very valuable. What's interesting though is that a lot of the managers, they don't, they don't seem to find it as valuable as the CTO does. But since the CTO is bought in on it, they'd go to it. <laughs> Which makes me happy because I can see a lot of value that, the, that this brings to that team because there's a ton of discussion about issues that happened the previous month uh, that they bring to the operations review and that sparks discussion on how they can actually improve or do things differently in order to be better and they can actually put uh, KPIs around that improvement to make sure they're tracking towards that improvement. So this, the fact that the CTO is so bought into this makes it hugely valuable. Uh, otherwise I would be having a challenge getting people to that meeting and reporting the metrics. However, the, the project management office finds that uh, the meeting is so valuable, the metrics are so valuable, they're actually, having, they're actually paying me to write my application so they can get more data and more metrics so they can get better and, and get more insight into, into the uh, teams. So implementing on one team, just having my slide decks and having some data and having my little island where I had my example, because uh, I literally set those boards up sat outside a conference room and talked about it to anybody that would come up and like, what is this? Well, let me explain it to you. Uh, it led to 15 teams gathering the metrics. Right now we have six teams attending the operations review. And some of these teams are uh, sales. I've trained sales teams. And unfortunately right now their managers are not coming to the trainings that I've had. Uh, but the, the uh, five sales guys that I've trained they love this because I talk about, you know, what if we created a class of service for you to sell and we can expedite that thing through the system and we can get paid big bucks for that. And they're like, oh yeah, that'd be great. Um, they also like it because they don't have visibility into their sales pipeline. They use Salesforce, but they still don't really understand where people are and who we need to call and what those policies are. So they, they actually really like uh, the Kanban stuff. Uh, I've trained, uh, our GIS team, which is Geological Information Systems. And they're a non-technical team, but they're huge. They're the biggest team in our company. Um, and they use Kanban to understand how long does it take to do all this non-technical work. And our land and lease team, they do it too. And they have a seasonal demand of some uh, work coming in. So we want to understand that and allocate capacity accordingly whenever that seasonal demand comes in. But we have three teams with a deep implementation. They've been doing it for three to six months. And We've seen a delivery rate increase of 135% to 225%, which is pretty good. One of our uh, change management teams is kind of DevOpsy. They, uh, it took them about six months to move over to Kanban. And uh, they, they were always they're highly interrupt driven and they were always uh, thinking they needed to hire more people. And, and whatnot, and I, was, I kept talking to the manager over and over again, hey, you know, if you, if you just try out these things, you know, you could probably d figure out if you needed to hire people or not. And so I created a three-day training course that I did through Agile Austin, which is a nonprofit organization in Austin, and she came to it, and I sent her through the feature bond game done by Mike Burroughs, and I did the Kanban game, and I had homework where they used my tools so they could export data and start learning those things. And so she started implementing that on her team. And she did it for a quarter and she realized, hey, you know, we don't need to hire anybody. This team's, they've got it. And they created two classes of service, one for all the interrupt-driven work 
and then one for their project work. And so they started giving SLAs to project work of about 10 business days, and they gave an SLA of about two to three days for any interrupt driven work that they had. So they drastically changed that team, and they started going at a sustainable pace, and so they weren't always stopping what they were doing and starting what the next person who walked up to them and asked them to do. I started giving a monthly corporate training class with the Git Kanban game. And this was important because this kind of spread the knowledge across the organization. And I actually showed it to the president and COO, and he, 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 he wanted to play the game, but I think the time commitment was a little too high for executives. Uh, so I, I've been made suggestions of doing maybe Feature Bond or something else, the name game. There's a whole bunch of little games that you can play for working process limits. We started tracking arrivals, discards, and blockers. Uh, the CTO started reporting the engineering team's uh, capacity forecast to executive leadership teams. And the CTO pointed this out. He's like, man, I can get the average cost per card per team. And if we do this random branch sampling of projects from the product team or marketing, we can kind of extrapolate what the cost of that project is and give a better guesstimate of what it's going to take. And then he can hand that off to finance or marketing or whoever needs to make the decision on if we're actually going to implement that, that project or not. And then we also added this dependency tracking with red, yellow, green status. So since we had the data, uh, they, had this they had this meeting once a week for dependencies and everybody had to be there. Uh, but once we implemented this with lead time data, we got their 90 percentile lead time. And we said, you know, for 90 percent confidence, you need to start it on this date if it's needed by, you know, date X. And then if you didn't have any dependencies and you were in the green, you didn't need to come to the meeting, so we saved some time. But if you were in yellow or red, which meant that you were 75% probability in yellow and 50% if you were in red, you had to be at that meeting in order to talk about, you know, what is going on, why haven't you started, do we need to move the date, et cetera. So it was kind of a, a trigger for uh, that discussion to happen. And so now we're, we're kind of doing it at scale. We have, like I said, about 15 teams doing it. And we're all driving demand to each other. And everybody's getting stuff done. And uh, a lot of teams are moving at a sustainable pace. But now that we've totally gone through this huge reorg, we, we don't really have a lot of data to know if the changes had the desired effect. So next week when I get back to Austin, we're having our first operations review since that big reorg. And the president and COO has accepted the invite, so he's going to be there, and that's going to be my question. What is your measure for success? What are, what are your metrics? He's a big metric guy. And so I can't imagine him not having something. So it'll be very interesting to see what he says. And so a few books that I'll recommend, and then open it up to questions. The Goal, obviously, uh, fictional story about theory of constraints and manufacturing. The Phoenix Project, which is kind of the equivalent from a DevOps point of view, very, very good books. Then Mike Burrow's book, Kanban from the Inside, which is actually outside there. Uh, I read that book as soon as it came out when I was traveling in Germany. It was a great, great book. Tons and tons of references in it for anything and everything you want. I mean, you can go in all sorts of different directions. Lots and lots and lots and lots of great stuff about Kanban. And then Dan Vacanti's book, Actionable Agile Metrics for Predictability. As you can see, he has a CFD scatter plot in his histogram, and he has a whole bunch more in this book, and he goes into great detail about each one of these charts. And if you want to know anything and everything about those charts, get that book. I highly recommend that book. So that's, that's it. Do you guys have any questions? You've been awful quiet. Yeah. So, you know, I didn't, I didn't really go out looking for resistance. I just started implementing it. And if I met resistance, like in my story at the very beginning, I just kind of let them go and do whatever they wanted to do. In fact, that team was, was the last team that I trained over to, over to Kanban. Um, and the guy, the scrum master on that team, kind of saw the writing on the wall and left. Uh, but, you know, the resistance that I, that I met, I, I didn't really feel it because I wasn't actively pursuing teams to change. Uh, they saw the value based on the metrics and what the metrics were telling them, and then everybody wanted it, and then they came to me. So that, that's how I influence people.
you find a lot of consistency and like really finding the truth and just working through it? So kind of a mix of both. People were coming and going all the time. One of the things that I introduced was the whole skills liquidity matrix and saying, okay, here's your team liquidity. And our teams were pretty small. I think the biggest one was seven people, so it was pretty you know, low overhead to do. Uh, if a team member left, now we could actually say what skills were leaving the company and what skills did we need to replace. And that really helped to make sure we were hiring uh, the right people with the right skill set. And if a project, one of our big projects, who, which is the number one project in the company, but they're not acting like it, which is strange, uh, they created it. And I, and, I, and I was saying, you know, what kind of work is coming in that we need? What are the skills required to do that work? And let's build a team on that if you're going to go with the strategy of building a team for this project. Um, and they didn't, they didn't necessarily do that. So we actually pulled the data uh, two weeks ago. And on average, it's taking them about 17 business days to get stuff done. And so that raises the flag for me. It's like, okay, well, if this is the number one priority for the business and we're losing customers because of it, you know, why are we taking 17 business days to, to get done? Like, what do we need to do in order to, to reduce that lead time and increase that throughput? So I did run into that, and I explained it that you know you don't necessarily have to do all of these meetings. Um, I would recommend that you do them because it's highly valuable for that feedback loop to come in. Uh, but I also said that you know you can combine a lot of these meetings into short meetings. And so earlier I was talking about it, and sometimes at the grooming session we would go over is is our system still fit for purpose? Is it still meeting the expectations of our customers? Uh, sometimes we would do the risk review at planning sessions, uh, and we would just and I would pretty much schedule them back to back in order for them to actually happen. Uh, and if the teams didn't want to do it, I got the project management office to actually implement the risk review, so we could understand blocker clustering and how long things were taking. And the CTO likes those blocker clustering charts, uh, so he would get that at the operations review. And so you know, not all teams would do all these meetings, but um, in one way or another, some form, it, a lot of it was happening. And so we were getting those feedback loops uh, in place uh, and making the changes, especially the operations review was probably the most valuable meeting that we have once a month because a lot of the issues were brought there. And that was a good place for me to say, hey, you know, you might want to consider adding this meeting, maybe 15 minutes, or I'll help facilitate it in order to, you know, get some value out of it. And if you feel like you're not getting value, you know, we can stop for a while and see how it goes. And if you don't like it, then we can roll it back and start it up again. And so I use it as a place to kind of evolve how the, how the teams were working independently of each other and communicating and whatnot, because one of the biggest complaints we had was communication. And so adding these feedback loops kind of helped that. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. So I don't, I don't know if I had the visibility, but I'll take my best shot on that. So we have a new president and COO that was hired back in February, and he hired one of his buddies who's a VP of product who came in about a month ago, and they decided to change it. And I, th I think it was due to cost, because we were doing a quarterly release planning session, and we were basically renting out a hotel and flying all these people in. And with the price of oil kind of tanking to $45 a barrel now when it was at 150 when we started this thing, uh, they said, we've got to cut that cost. We can't, we can't afford that anymore. Um, but what's, what's interesting is that the project management team is not changing their strategy on how to run that meeting. You know, now they're, they're, they're still going to have all hands, but it's going to be in the building. And they're still going to run the same type of exercises. Here's the, here's the batch stuff coming in for product. 
And now you have four hours to decide if you can actually commit to all of that or not. So it's just going to cause more problems, I'm predicting. Um, but I'm trying to, trying to flatten that demand curve out because it's, it's it just goes through these huge cycles and morale gets hit and people get stressed out. And, and uh, it's, just, it's just not good for the company as a whole, in my opinion. Thanks. So we're at we're at time. Does anybody have any other questions or comments? Thank you.